Let me first start with Ambassador Chinoy. Uh, since Ambassador Chinoy currently chairs the T20 process out of India and has been one of our most uh, uh, vocal and visible voices uh, articulating India's um, vision and India's ambitions around the presidency. Ambassador Chinoy, let me turn to you for the theme question itself. Polarized world, fragmented world order, how can we coalesce together at the G20? What are your ambitions to bring all of us together for a common future? Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saran. Firstly, it's a great privilege to be here in Kigali, uh, which is one of the most uh, dynamic uh, parts of Africa. Uh, and it's entirely opposite that this uh, topic is being discussed in a country that's dealt with fragmentation and polarized politics. And so there's a thing or two that we can learn from Rwanda as well as we look at the lessons for the rest of the world as well. As far as I see it, I would have preferred to use the term fractured instead of fragmented. For fragmented uh, uh, gives me the impression that it's like Humpty Dumpty, where uh, you know, the pieces can never be put together again. But if it's fractured, I do believe that uh, we have been through this before and that there can be a healing of fractures as well. The way I see the world today, it's inevitable that in a world in flux, we are in fact increasingly divided along roughly seven factors, the seven T's as I would put it. We have uh, trade greatly dividing the world today, but trade is also fungible and therefore not very easy to securitize as we have seen in the uh, narrative going from decoupling to de-risking, etc. It's management of uh, what is called otherwise an inevitable dependency one on the other. But then there is technology, which is uh, today uh, reeling under a securitization. Uh, and uh, it is uh, crafted much more carefully uh, in terms of denials and, and uh, sanctions, etc. Then there is the T of territory, which divides us, whether in Asia, in terms of disputes or in Europe, the fourth T of terrorism, without which dealing with terrorism is very important for uh, societies to prosper and to, to make progress. And then we have uh, the fifth T of uh, uh, tenets, as in narratives, as to whose narrative is superior uh, and whose ideology is superior. The sixth one is transparency uh, or the utter lack of it today. Uh, and the seventh one is trust, which is also lacking uh, across the board. But when I look at the scenario, I feel that we are all trying to reinvent the wheel. Because uh, when you look at uh, UNGA Resolution 75-1 of 21st September 2020, that is the 75th anniversary of the UN, it has everything in it. Mother's milk and apple pie, nothing that can be refuted by anyone. Gender equality, economic development, uh, multilateral UN reforms, leave no one behind, all of it is there. And if you go back a little further to 2015, you have the UN that has already agreed on 17 SDGs. So why is it that we are today trying to reinvent the wheel when there is global consensus on what is of greater priority and urgency? And we have to therefore look at addressing the key concerns before the global south, especially. The next round, and I'm going to start with you again, Ambassador Chinoy. So clearly we have uh, some sort of an odd situation. Uh, some people describe it as uh, the inertia of uh, multipolarity, that when you have uh, multiple power centers, multiple uh, actors with different agendas, you tend to be frozen into inaction, or rather you find it difficult to create consensus. And yet we have heard in the opening session that we confront common challenges. Uh, climate being the most obvious, but the future of our technology and digital societies being another one, uh, SDGs and poverty and, and the backsliding curtsy, the pandemic for many of our uh, fellow citizens around the world are all real issues. Now, having heard all of this in the first, having heard yourself in the first uh, segment of this, uh, I would like to discuss with all of you, uh, starting with Ambassador Chinoy, how could we create frameworks that could respond to some of these most urgent challenges? So what could be a climate response in a world where uh, we are uh, disagreeing on literally everything else? Uh, and can we come together? Can China and US work together on climate, for example? Or can Europe and Africa 
have a trustworthy relationship. You mentioned trust. Can we somehow create specific trust for specific tasks in a world that doesn't trust each other generally? So to start with, I would say that uh, it's not really multipolarity that has caused inertia. In fact, if anything, multipolarity should add to the dynamism that uh, is uh, being seen around the world as we move towards uh, uh, greater multipolarity, uh, less multilateralism. It's multipolarity that is actually trying to keep things going. But the three real issues that have caused this kind of fracturing, if I could continue to use that term, is firstly that globalization has not benefited all equally. In fact, some have gamed globalization, some have benefited more, some have benefited hardly from globalization. The second problem is that uh, the balance of power is not the same as it was at the end of the Second World War when the current multilateral structures were set up. And there is uh, an uncanny uh, reluctance to accept the change in the balance of power. So that is causing a lot of tension and uh, fracturing also. The third point here is the what I would call the privileging of priorities. Uh, to see it uh, in a blinkered manner from one's own uh, geography, one's own nationalism. And I think that is challenging uh, uh, what we call the efficacy of multilateral institutions. And I think the G20 is well placed to speak on behalf of uh, the large majority because it includes uh, the permanent members of the Security Council. It includes the BRICS. It includes just about 50% uh, 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 of this membership of uh, you know, G20 plus the nine invitees. Uh, together, when we look at it, 14 uh, turn up to be with a Global South identity. So the Global South is also uh, inherently represented in the G20. And I think the G20 therefore needs to uh, you know, sort of speak on behalf of uh, the global community without any kind of uh, privileged exceptionalism. Now, if within the G20, uh, which also has the G7, if the G7, uh, you know, under Japan's leadership works very well with India, we can actually achieve much more for the global south. If the G7 is torn between that and its prioritization of certain issues um, and uh, moves towards uh, kind of uh, reflecting the priorities uh, that ought to be before the P5 in the Security Council, if it starts working like the Security Council, uh, focusing more on sanctions, focusing more on some kind of exclusive uh, sort of dealing uh, of, of the challenges currently in Europe, then I think the Global South will get relegated to the background. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to take questions from all of you. Uh, are, you all warm? are you all warmed up? Can you ask questions? Are you interested in... Yeah, so you can walk to the mic here, and there is a mic coming to your right hand side. You can walk up to the mic and pose your questions. We will uh, try and collect uh, two or three of them. Um, so we have a gentleman here who wants to ask a question. Please walk up to the mic. Anyone here on this side wants to come to the mic? Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Vishnu Prati from Nepal. I am a researcher, policy researcher. I have two interrelated short questions. One, during the COVID time, we realized really saw the face of the powerfuls, those who were able to produce the vaccine, and they were restoring for their third doses, and the people in the country where there was no vaccine were dying for the first doses. And there, there was no such type of the collaboration. So how we can see that? And the second point to all of you is that, is still the known alignment is a valid um, uh, international instrument or now it is a need to go through the um, uh, alliance of the common interest or the national interest of the commonalities. Thank you. Okay. Any other question for this round or I come back? He asked two questions so, and both of them are interesting. Um, okay. So let's start non-alignment. Ambassador Chinoy, non-alignment or its variants, how important are they in today's world? And maybe let's take that first and we'll come to the pandemic after this. So I think the starting point here is that uh, the world needs more than binary choices. And uh, uh, the African continent, as in the African Union, or a large country like India, 
uh, we can, uh, working together, actually offer something beyond those binary choices. And India has shown uh, that uh, willingness uh, and uh, uh, that performance uh, during uh, periods of crisis, including during the pandemic. Uh, I think the last thing we want is uh, spheres of influence, which is why the Indo-Pacific is also very important, because it is far more representative uh, than the uh, privileged uh, concept of the Asia-Pacific, which some countries want to preserve as a sphere of influence. And we have to get away from that because the Indo-Pacific includes Africa, it includes all of us, and is more in tune with our aspirations, more democratic, more representative. But I do feel that uh, uh, it is time for us to look at uh, uh, core values when we are looking at uh, uh, multipolarity. Uh, and non-alignment is not a bad word. Uh, it has also not remained uh, dormant or stagnant. It has evolved. Even at the height of non-alignment, you are aware that many countries that were in the NAM movement were actually quite aligned. Many hosted bases for one superpower or the other. Many sought help and assistance from uh, the one or uh, the other of the superpowers at times of need. Uh, today, I would say it's not so much non-alignment as multi-alignment or issue-based alignment. And that, I think, is a right that we all uh, reserve for reserve. ourselves. Our South African colleague also said that there's no country in the world that does not act in its national interest. So non-alignment is different today. Um, in a multipolar world, it is multi-alignment and issue-based alignment. And may there be more of that, because that really creates a level playing field, which uh, allows uh, the lesser powers among us, lesser economies, to actually bridge uh, the absolute gaps in comprehensive national power through such hedging, multi-alignment and issue-based alignment. May there be more of it. Ambassador, you wanted to come in. Go ahead, go ahead, it's working. Yeah, I'm tempted to jump in here because uh, I think it's not easy to scrap the current international order. Uh, in oh. fact, uh, it's very difficult to bring about genuine reform, as we've all seen. Even if we look at the UNGA route to reforms of the United Nations, we must realize that you require two-thirds majority and you require all the five permanent members voting in favor of any change to implement any change. So that change is not going to come about uh, voluntarily or from a goodness of the heart, uh, etc. It's very difficult once there are privileged positions. What we have to see is how we can not just uh, reinvigorate the existing system, but to try and bring about meaningful reforms. But even more important is to see how existing institutions can cooperate with new and parallel institutions. And if we can have some kind of a modicum of equality, democracy, uh, and give and take, we might be able to perform better, I think, including for climate finance and things like that. So parallel institutions, um, the AIIB, or the New Development Bank, or the BRICS, uh, these must also uh, be seen for the value that they might bring uh, to certain geographies, especially. Uh, and of course, final question to you was, Ambassador Chinoy, on what do you want from the Brazilian presidency? Uh, you are going to be hosting 120 track one events, another 100 or so track two events. Do you want them to also have a party every day in Rio for the next uh, year? So what are your expectations from the Brazilian presidency? My own view is that uh, uh, India's G20 presidency should not be seen as a one-off event. Uh, in fact, the very fact that uh, we have a series of uh, uh, developing countries of the Global South chairing the G20 augurs well, it should be a relay in which uh, we each contribute to the next presidency. So I think uh, uh, Brazil will have uh, an advantage that it can build on uh, what India does this year, and India has also greatly benefited from Indonesia. South Africa will also benefit in the future. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the uh, securitization question is concerned, I do feel that uh, uh, some countries have used 
the phenomenal accretion of economic power to securitize certain geographies. And I think that is creating an issue. Uh, it's a practical uh, reality of life, uh, but I wish there were less of it. And if countries were able to separate their privileged, uh, you know, securitized positions in the uh, UN Security Council from the uh, pressing economic requirements of the Global South, they would do humanity a great deal of good.